that's enough and probably more than you ever cared to know about wheat genetics. But that takes care of the einkorn portion of this flour. There are two other aspects to the bread that we've been talking about. It is sprouted einkorn flour. We're going to talk a little bit about sprouting. It's also a sourdough bread. We're going to talk about sourdough. They actually have similar effect, and they are both processing methods that have been used by various cultures in processing of grains and foods to make them easier to eat. So what is sprouting? Sprouting is when you take the grain, say a grain of wheat, and you hydrate it, you moisten it, and then you let it just start to sprout. So it breaks open the seed and starts to grow, and then you heat it so that that process stops. You stop all the enzymes by heat, dry it, and then grind it into flour. And the interesting effect of that is you've effectively taken a seed and changed it into a vegetable just in that moment, because now it's no longer in its seed form. It started to break out. A number of changes happen. Multiple enzymes break down. Phytic acid is reduced, which is a, a molecule that can bind to various minerals and reduce absorption of things like zinc. It also decreases ATIs. So again, remember I talked about the ATIs being a means of allowing the seed to pass through the intestinal tract unharmed. But once the seed starts sprouting, it presumes it's in the ground and ready to start growing, and it, it no longer needs those ATIs. So that's a way of reducing that. It also degrades some of the gliadin. So again, going into the growth phase of becoming a grass, which, which is what wheat is, the gliadin is no longer as important, and that portion of the protein starts to be broken. We don't exactly know what it does to fructans. You know, if you try to sprout onions or sprout wheat, different things seem to happen. We're still learning about that. But in general, it seems to break down the ATIs, reduce phytic acid, and partially degrade the gliadin gluten. Now, sourdough does the same thing, has all of those same effects, but on steroids. So standard baking practice just uses Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's a single wheat. It's a monoculture. It's just one organism that replicates infinitely. A sourdough is a bunch of different organisms, not least of which is lactobacilli, which is a type of bacteria that produce lactic acid. And they seem to actually break down gluten. So as they start fermenting, they not only break down the carbohydrates, but they partially break down gluten. Now that can make working with the dough somewhat trickier because the gluten is not as strong. And that goes back again. These older methods have the downside of making bread making more technically difficult. Uh, just like using einkorn wheat does, but it seems to have a variety of positive health effects. They've actually done similar studies as what I talked about with einkorn, where they gave sourdough fermented wheat, and this was regular wheat, this was not einkorn, to people with celiac disease. It had been fermented for 72 hours, and they did not seem to have the same reaction as standard baker's yeast fermented wheat. Now, all fermentation breaks down some carbohydrates, so the total amount of carbohydrate in the flour is higher than the total amount of carbohydrate in the bread. There's no way to really measure how much that has changed. The other interesting thing is that if you just put lactobacilli in addition to the baker's yeast, it doesn't seem to have the same effect as sourdough. There's something about the particular combination of wild yeast, lactobacilli, other bacteria, that create the effect that sourdough is known for. And that kind of goes back to what we're talking about, the Lindy effect, is that prior to 1600, all bread was sourdough. That was just the way bread was made. There wasn't sourdough. Um, you know, that was bread. And that is the older technology. Sourdough bread making is actually the older version. Modern bread making using instant yeast or, or even baker's yeast is a more modern industrialized version and has some of these negative effects. The other important part is that sourdough, just like sprouting, breaks down ATIs. So even for people who have non-celiac wheat sensitivity, this breakdown of ATIs can occur. It also seems to break down some fructans in a more predictable way. And so sourdough in general may be more tolerable to anyone with a wheat sensitivity whether that's generated by celiac disease, though obviously there will be some gluten, so that's a big question mark there someone with non-celiac wheat sensitivity and someone who just has irritable bowel syndrome in response to consuming wheat will also do better 
with sourdough process. One last aspect of sourdough is that it acidifies the dough. It makes that dough more acidic by dropping the pH, generating lactic acid, other byproducts. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the baker's yeast, only produces carbon dioxide and alcohol. Sourdough products, the lactobacilli and other bacteria, also produce malic acid, lactic acid, acetic acid, as well as carbon dioxide and alcohol. And as a result, the dough is more acidic. That acidity actually facilitates gluten breakdown. And so once again, by multiple methods, the sourdough process facilitates breakdown of gluten. Now the interesting thing is, if you just add acid to a dough, it does not have the same effect as sourdough. And they've tried this, adding external acids to a dough to see whether you get the same improvement in degradation, and that isn't it. So by, by mechanisms that we don't fully understand, the sourdough process seems to improve degradation of gluten and improve the tolerability of wheat.